And I, in, in turn, urge all of you to give a generous contribution to Tulane University. <laughs> um, it's great to be here. This is, uh, this is my second time at the, this festival. I came in year one, and now it's year three. It's like a lot bigger. <laughs> it, the last time I spoke, it was me and three people, but now we've got <laughs> people on the stairways. Um, and it's a pleasure to be in uh, New Orleans. It's my favorite city in America to visit, so I never pass up an opportunity. <laughs> My first visit, I was with John McCain, and they were making a movie of his life in the Hanoi Hilton outside of New Orleans. And we, he, we film, he watches the movie, he takes me to the casino here, this is pre-Katrina. Uh, he tells me how to play roulette. I get 500 bucks in chips, I'm winning, because he told me where to put my money. Uh, and he has no patience, so he says, we're not waiting in line to cash in your chips, we're gonna just leave. So I walked with my $500 in chips. <laughs> then we went to Antoine's for dinner, and it was one of those Antoine's meals where you get like 9,000 courses, 35,000 calories, eight different kinds of booze. And I finish it up with this flaming coffee, which they put brandy or something in, and they put it on this tablecloth, and I've got a cup of flaming coffee, and I turn to the waiter and I say, is it decaf? Uh, so like, um, I've got to adjust to the, let the good times roll culture here. Um, um, so I'm, I'm going to give a, a little talk uh, about my book, and it turns out to be a, my favorite subject myself. Um, you may have um, seen that movie, Fiddler on the Roof. And if you saw that movie, you know how warm and huggy Jewish families can be, always singing and laughing and dancing. Uh, I come from the other kind of Jewish family. And so the culture in our family was think Yiddish, act British. Uh, and so stiff upper lip, no emotion. Um, my nursery school teacher apparently told my parents when I was four that David doesn't really play with the other kids, he just watches them. <laughs> Which is good for a career in journalism, uh, but not necessarily good for a career as an intimate friend of people. Uh, and then, when I was seven, I read a book called Paddings in the Bear, uh, and I decided that moment I wanted to become a writer. And writing was key to my identity ever since. And I remember in high school I wanted to date this woman named Bernice, and she didn't want to date me, she wanted to date some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. <laughs> and so those were my values. And it, it led to a little solitariness and, and aloofness uh, and living up in your head. And then when I was 18, the admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, and if you know Chicago, it, it's the favorite saying about it. It's where fun goes to die. Um, <laughs> My, my favorite saying, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> and so it's very heady, very cerebral, and I fit, in, fit right in. I had a double major in history and celibacy while I was there at Chicago. <laughs> and, um, and we did something which is true. That we, my freshman roommate entered the Golden Gloves competition. Uh, and we gave him a nickname. He had never boxed a day in his life. Uh, we gave him a nickname, the Kosher Killer. And we trained uh, the Chicago way. We didn't practice boxing, but we read a lot of books about boxing. Uh, and his illustrious career lasted 29 minutes. Uh, 29 seconds, actually. So this is all to say I became a little cerebral and a little emotionally reserved and maybe emotionally removed. Uh, and then I went out in the world of journalism, which is also a bit of a self-distancing. Uh, I got a job as a, a conservative columnist at the New York Times a job I likened to being chief rabbi in Mecca. Uh, not a lot of company there. Uh, and then I got a job on TV, but it was the most cerebral version of TV, which is the PBS NewsHour. And so we have long 12-minute conversations. It's kind of intellectual for TV. And we have a wonderfully learned uh, audience, uh, somewhat seasoned. Um, and, so if a 93-year-old lady comes up to me in the airport, I know what she's going to say. I don't watch your program, but my mother loves it. And so, like, like, it's, it's a, and so this amounts to a certain kind of life. And it's epitomized to me an event that happened to me like 10, 15 years ago, where I'm at a baseball game. I love baseball. I've been to thousands of games. I've never caught a foul ball. And a batter loses control of the bat. The bat flies in the air and lands in my lap. So getting a bat is a thousand times better than getting a ball. <laughs> Any normal human being holds his trophy in the air, high fives everybody, hugs people, gets on the jumbotron. I put the bat at the ground and just stood, stared straight ahead. <laughs> the emotional reaction of a turtle. So it was just nothing. 
And I look back on that guy and I think, show a little emotion. And so I decided, uh, a great novelist, Fred Beekner, says, if you wall yourself off from emotion and intimacy, you're walling yourself off from the holy sources of life itself. And so I'm not an exceptional person, but I am a grower. I try to grow. And so I did it the Chicago way. I wrote a book about emotion <laughs> called The Social Animal. And then I wrote a book about spiritual improvement called The Road to Character. And I learned that writing a book on character doesn't give you good character, actually. <laughs> and even reading a book on character doesn't give you good character. But buying a book on character does. <laughs> so I recommend that. Uh, and then I wrote uh, two other books. And I did change. Uh, I think I've become more emotionally open. I was at a conference in Nantucket a couple of years ago. And it was like a room like this. And the speaker handed out pieces of paper to everybody. And on it were lyrics to a love song. And we were all instructed to find a stranger, gaze into their eyes, and sing the love song into their eyes. And if you'd asked me to do that 15 years ago, I would have spontaneously combusted. <laughs> but I found some guy, I sang the love song into his eyes. It was like the new me, I mean, you know. Uh, I've become a little emotionally unblocked. <laughs> and the sad thing is that as I've become a little more human, American society has become a little more dehumanized. And so you know all the know the statistics, depression rates are rising, suicide rates are rising. 36% uh, of Americans report feeling lonely much of the time. The number of Americans who have no close personal friends is up by fourfold since 2000. The number of Americans not in a romantic relationship is up by a third uh, since 2000. The number of Americans who rate themselves in the lowest happiness category has increased by 50% since 2000. So there's some sort of spiritual and relational breakdown happening in our society. Uh, and some of it is uh, sadness, we're just sadder. And when you make people sad, you end up making them mean. Because when people feel alone and invisible, they regard that as an injustice, which it is. And they feel threatened, and they want to lash out. My sister-in-law is a nurse at a hospital in New Jersey, and she says her hospital's biggest problem is keeping staff. Because the patients have become so abusive, the nurses burn out and retire. And so it's just become not only a sadder country, but a meaner country. And so what's happened to cause all this? There are a bunch of stories one could tell, and I think I agree with all of them. There's the technology story, social media is driving us all crazy. There's the sociology story, we're less active in, in civic life. There's the demography story, we're becoming wonderfully more diverse society, but it's harder to know people who don't share your background. You have to make a little more effort. There's the economy story, we're more inequality, we're living different kinds of lives. And I agree with all those stories, but my story is the most direct which over several generations, we've lost the ability to teach people social skills to be uh, kind and considerate to people in the complex circumstances of life. Being kind and considerate to people is, requires an open heart, but it also requires just social skills, like things like you can teach in a school, like learning tennis or carpentry, how to be a good listener, how to end conversations gracefully, how to sit with someone who's depressed, how to break up with someone without crushing their heart, how to host a dinner party so everybody feels included. These are just basic social skills. And there's one skill at the apex of all these skills. It's the ability to make others feel seen, heard, respected, and understood. And that's the ultimate social skill. And so the book is really an attempt to figure out what is this skill and how do you get better at it. And I allow myself a dualism every 10 years or so. And so in the book, I make a distinction between diminishers and illuminators. Diminishers are people who make you feel unseen. They're not curious about you. They never ask you questions. And I'll sometimes leave a party and I'll think, you know, that whole time nobody asked me a question. And I've come to conclude like 30 or 40 percent of America, uh, of humanity are question askers. The rest are nice people. They just don't ask you questions. And so diminishers are not curious. They stereotype. They ignore. They do a thing called stacking, which is they learn one fact about you and then they make a whole series of assumptions about who you must also be. You're a Trump voter, therefore X blah, 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 blah. And stacking's always wrong. I, I heard about a Trump voter who was a lesbian biker who converted to Sufi Islam after surviving a plane crash. <laughs> and I'm like, what stereotype do you fit into? <laughs> like, on the other side, there are illuminators. And illuminators have a persistent curiosity about people. They make you feel seen, lit up. Uh, and so Ian e. Foster was a novelist who wrote, I don't know, 120 years ago in England. Um, and his biographer wrote of him, to speak to him was to be seduced by an inverse charisma, 
a sense of being listened to with such intensity, you had to be your most honest, sharpest, and best self. That's just a great way to listen. There's a story, maybe apocryphal, told about Jenny Jerome. And Jenny Jerome was, would later become the mother of Winston Churchill. But when she's a young woman, she's in Victorian England, and she's seated at a dinner party next to William Gladstone, the Prime Minister. And she leaves that dinner thinking that Gladstone is the cleverest person in England. A couple, sometime later, she's at a different dinner, and she happens to be seated next to Gladstone's great political rival, Benjamin Disraeli. And she leaves that dinner thinking that she's the cleverest person in England. <laughs> so it's good to be Gladstone. It's better to make people feel the way Disraeli made people feel. There's a famous research facility called Bell Labs, uh, and uh, they were trying to figure out, some of the researchers were way more innovative than some of the others, and they tried to figure out why. Education level, IQ, they couldn't figure it out. Then they realized the most productive researchers were in the habit of having breakfast or lunch with an electrical engineer named Harry Nyquist. And Nyquist asked them about their problems, helped them think it through, and suggested solutions. He illuminated and walked through their mental processes with them. And it's just a beautiful skill. So this is the skill of being able to see others deeply and be deeply seen. Now, how good are you at seeing others? Well, we're in New Orleans. I once was here about five years ago, and I said, one of the problems in America is that we don't know our neighbors. And I was around a table with about 15 people from this city, and they all looked at me quizzically like, what are you talking about? We all know our neighbors. What are you, what are you? <laughs> so this is sort of an exception to the national trend. <laughs> but nonetheless, even with your ultra-social heritage in the city, um, you're probably not as good as you think you are. And so there's a guy at the University of Texas who studies people. How well do we understand each other when we're in conversation with them? How well do we understand what's going on in somebody else's mind? The average person understands the other person 22% of the time. Some people are pretty good. They, they, they understand the other person 55% of the time. Some people are 0% and think they're 100%. <laughs> and those are the people who miss all your social cues. So I just try to walk people through the process, the steps you take to get to be better at knowing someone. And the first step, is the first gaze. You just meet someone. You just encounter someone. It's the first moment. And when we first meet someone, we have unconsciously some questions going on in our head. Is this person going to be nice to me? Is this, am I priority to this person? Am I even a person to this person? And the answers to those questions are revealed in your eyes before any words come out of your mouth. It's the power, the moral power of attention. And I was taught this lesson. I was in Waco, Texas. And I was having breakfast with a 93-year-old lady named LaRue Dorsey. And Mrs. Dorsey was a stern disciplinarian. She'd been a teacher much of her life. And she said, I love my students enough to discipline them. And it was very drill sergeant. I was a little intimidated by this formidable lady. Into the diner walks a mutual friend of ours named Jimmy Durrell, a pastor who pastors to the homeless in Waco, Waco. And he comes over to our table. And he grabs Mrs. Dorsey by the shoulders. And he shakes her way harder than you should ever shake a 93-year-old. <laughs> and he says to her, Mrs. Dorsey, Mrs. Dorsey, you're the best, you're the best. I love you, I love you. And that stern drill sergeant lady I'd been talking to turned in an instant into a bright, eye-shining nine-year-old girl. Jimmy's attention brought out a different version of him, her. And partly it's just Jimmy has a warmer personality than I do. But the, the deeper point is that Jimmy's a pastor. And so when Jimmy meets anybody, Anybody, he thinks he's meeting someone made in the image of God. He thinks he's staring into the face of God. Somebody who has a soul of no size, weight, color, or shape, but gives them infinite value of dignity. Somebody so important, Jesus was willing to die for that person. And so you can be a Christian, Jewish, atheist, Muslim, don't care. But treating each person you meet with that level of reverence and respect is a precondition for seeing them well. Everybody has that level of dignity. The second stage is uh, accompaniment. Most of the time when we're with each other, we're not having deep conversations into each other's eyes. We're just doing stuff together. We're at a meeting, we're picking up our kids from school, we're hanging out at some organization. And accompaniment is an other-centered way of being with another person. It's just like, I'm paying attention to you. Think of the way the pianist accompanies a singer. The pianist is there watching what she's doing, trying to make her shine. It's just an other-centered way of being in the world. Uh, and that is just a, a way of being. And often the best kinds of accompaniment involve play. When we play, whether it's anything, whether it's poker, whether it's bingo, whether it's God help us pickleball, um, 
we're ourselves, we're naturally ourselves. I played basketball with some guys for years. We never had a deep conversation, but we felt like we would die for each other because we did all the trash talk, the high-fiving, all the things you do in play. It's just a wonderful way to encounter somebody in their natural state. When my oldest child was about 12 months, God, we were living in Brussels, and he would wake up at 4 a.m. every day. Uh, bless him. Uh, and I would have to get up at 4 and play with him until I went to work at about 10. And in 12, 13 months, I remember he's playing on my chest, and I think, I know him better than I've known anybody because he's been so open with me, and he knows me better than anybody's ever known me. And we had never exchanged a word because he couldn't talk yet. But through play, there was just some sort of deep communication between us. Sometimes accompaniment is just showing up, just showing up at the right time. And so I had a student uh, at Yale, I only teach at schools I couldn't have gotten into, um, um, <laughs> named Jillian Sawyer. And I had her as a grad student. Uh, and in, at, uh, when she was in college, her dad got pancreatic cancer. And they had a conversation that he would probably miss a lot of her big life events, like her wedding. And she would later go on um, after college and get invited to be bridesmaid at one of her friend's wedding. She goes to the wedding, she sees the father of the bride give a beautiful toast to his daughter, and then it comes time for the father-daughter dance. And she's sitting there at the reception and she says, I just think I'm not gonna get through this. So she goes to the ladies' room to have a cry. And when she gets out of the ladies' room, she sees all of the people who are at her table and the adjoining table standing there in the hallway. And she wrote a paper about the experience which she gave me permission to quote, and she wrote, what I will remember forever is that no one said a word. Each person, including, new, including newer boyfriends who I knew less well, gave me a reaffirming hug and headed back to their table. No one lingered or awkwardly tried to validate my grief. They were there for me just for a moment, and it was exactly what I needed. That's just presence. Now the next phase of getting to know someone after the first gaze and then accompaniment is conversation. If you're gonna know what somebody else is thinking in their head, you can't try to imagine it, you have to ask them. Uh, and so in Washington, um, where I live, we're terrible at conversation. I'll give you an example. I was calling uh, on the phone with a friend of mine, this was back in the Obama years, a friend of mine who worked in the White House, and we're talking and I'm on my cell and the call drops. So I think he'll realize and he'll call me back in two minutes. Well, two minutes go by, four minutes go by, five minutes go by, Finally, eight minutes go by, and I call his office, and I talk to his assistant, and she says, oh, he can't talk to you, he's on the phone. So I say, no, he's on the phone with me. He, he's just been blathering on for 10 minutes. Um, and so that's bad conversation. <laughs> um, and so I called around and asked a conversation experts, how do you get better? And they gave me some tips, and I'll show a few of which I'll share. Uh, one, treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. If you're going to be with somebody, make it 100% or 0%. Don't try to 60% it and multitask. Two, be a loud listener. I have a buddy, when you talk to him, it's like you're talking to a Pentecostal church. He's like, uh-huh, yes, preach, amen, amen. <laughs> Just love talking to that guy. Um, make them authors, not witnesses. People don't go into enough detail when they're recounting the events of their life. If you say, well, where was your boss sitting when she said that to you? Then suddenly they're back in the scene and they're narrating it and you get a much richer version of what they went through. Don't fear the pause. If we're having an important conversation, I say something important, and my comment starts at my shoulder and ends up at my fingertips, at what point have you stopped thinking so you can think of how to respond? Probably right about here. So if it's important, the nice thing to do is to let me talk to my fingertips, hold up your hand, then pause and consider how to respond. So don't fear that pause. Don't be a topper, this is something we all do. If you come up to me and say, you know, I just had a horrible flight. Uh, we were on the tarmac for two hours. And I say, oh, I know what you went through. I had a horrible flight once. I was on the tarmac for six hours. It sounds like I'm trying to relate to you. But really what I'm trying to do is say, let's not talk about your inferior set of experiences. Let's talk about my better experiences. So don't be a topper. Two final ones. Uh, keep the gem statement at the center. When you're in conflict, there's usually something deep down you agree upon. If my brother and I are fighting about our dad's health care, we both want what's best for our dad. So if we can return to that thing we have in common, the gem statement will save the relationship amid arguments. And finally, uh, find the disagreement under the disagreement. 
This comes from Jewish Talmudic scholarship. If we're arguing, what's the philosophical reason deep down that's causing us to see this differently? Suddenly it's not a fight, it's a joint exploration for philosophical differences. Finally, the, the quality of your conversations will depend on the quality of your questions. And so asking great questions is essential. Just uh, being a great conversationalist. Uh, I had a friend named Naomi Wei, I have a friend named Naomi Wei, who among other things teaches seventh grade boys in New York City how to be journalists. And her first day of teaching this, she goes to the front of the class and say, okay, ask me any question, I'll answer it honestly, whatever you want. So the first question was, are you married? No. Another boy, are you divorced? Yes. Another boy, do you still love him? She's like, whoa. <laughs> uh, and she, um, she starts crying. And she said, yes. And then they said, does he know? And then the next question was, do your kids know? Like they just kept going, going, going. And they're kids, like we were all great question askers once. But we sort of lose the ability as we get more shy and self-conscious as we age. Now great questions, as I intimated, are storytelling questions. Like in journalism, I no longer ask people, what do you think of this? I ask, how did you come to believe this? That way they're telling me about an experience or a person who, 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 who made them think the way they do, the story. I read about a, fame, a focus group lady who was hired by grocery stores uh, to find out why people went to the grocery store late at night. And she could have just asked the focus group, why do you go to the grocery store late at night? Instead, she asked a storytelling quest question, which is, tell me about the last time you went to the grocery store after 11 p.m. And one lady who hadn't spoken up in the focus group said, well, I'd smoked a joint, and I needed a menage a trois with me, Ben and Jerry. And so you, you get a little glimpse into her life. Um, now, the best questions are 30,000 feet questions. Once you get to know somebody, you have to have a trusting relationship, where you step back and say, let's think about our lives. And so you can ask, if the next five years is a chapter in, life, in your life, what's the chapter about? Sort of step back and think about it. If we met a year from now, what would we be celebrating? What would you do if you weren't afraid? How does fear play a role in your life? I had a buddy who was being interviewed for a job, and he turned around and asked the interviewer, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And she started crying, because she wouldn't be doing HR for that company. Uh, she just needs security. Um, Peter Block, who writes beautifully about community, uh, has some deep questions. You really have to know people about these. Uh, what's the no or refusal you keep postponing? What commitments have you made that you no longer believe in? What is the gift you currently hold in exile? What talents you have you're not using? Uh, and I, I was at a dinner party, um, it's been about six months now, and I asked the group, how do your ancestors show up in your life? Like, we're all formed by our heritage, but how, how, how does it work for you? And there was a Dutch couple there, and they talked about their Dutch heritage. There's a black couple who talked about African-American heritage. I talked about 5,000 years of Jewish history. And we learned things about ourselves and about each other. It took a normal conversation and made it a memorable conversation, which is sort of our goal here. Now, so far I've been describing uh, interpersonal connection in a normal society. But we don't live in a normal society. We live in a society of polarization, conflict, as I said, sadness and meanness. For just a few minutes, I'd like to talk about some of the harder conversations we have. And the first one is how to talk to someone who's suffering from depression. I had a longtime friend in my life who I met when I was 11 at summer camp uh, named Peter. And he had a wonderful life. He was an eye surgeon, great marriage, wonderful boys. And at 57, he got hit uh, with severe depression. Uh, and I thought I understood depression, but I learned you can't understand depression by extrapolating from your own moments of sadness if you've been lucky enough and never been hit by it. Uh, another friend of mine said, depression is a malfunction in the instrument we use to perceive reality. And so my friend Pete had these obsessive voices in his head that were lying to him, saying, you're worthless, nobody would miss you if you're gone. And so he just saw he had voices in his head just lying to him. And I made the mistakes, because I was unskilled, that I think a lot of people make. The first mistake I made was um, I tried to give him ideas about how to get out of depression. So I'd say, you used to do these service trips to Vietnam, why don't you do that? That'll, that'll make you, you know, your mood lift. And I later learned if you're giving people ideas about how to get out of depression, all you're communicating is that you don't get it. Because it's not ideas they're lacking. It's a lot else, but it's not ideas. 
The second make, mistake I made is called positive reframing, which I tried to remind him of all the good things in his life. Your marriage is great, the boys are great, you live in a one lovely town. And I learned when you do that, you're making the person feel worse because they're not enjoying the things that are palpably enjoyable. And so over the three years that Pete went through it, uh, I learned a few things. Uh, first, I can try to acknowledge the reality of the situation. Just say, this sucks. And try as hard as you can to have him describe how bad it sucks. Just acknowledge the reality of the situation. Two, a burst of goodwill. I want more for you. I want more for you. Three, a sense of, I am never leaving. Because I know Pete felt, I'm no fun to be around. Why would anybody want to hang around with me? And so I learned it's so important to say, no, this is not shaking anything. And I wish, in retrospect, that I had sent more little touches, a text here, an email there, just to say, no response necessary, you're just on my mind. And I didn't uh, do a lot of that stuff. And then I read later um, from Viktor Frankl uh, that he, he was in the death camp, psychologist, I hope everybody's read Man's Search for Meaning. Um, he would say when somebody was thinking about suicide, he would say, um, life has not stopped expecting things of you. That sounds a little rough to me, but to say, you know, there's still life is demanding things of you. And among other things is your ability to talk with people who are suffering. There's a great Thornton Wilder passage. Without your wound, where would your power be? It is your very remorse that makes your low voice tremble in the hearts of men. The very angels themselves cannot persuade the wretched and blundering children on earth, as can one human being, broken on the wheels of living, in love service only the wounded soldiers can serve. And so people who've been through that have a credibility and a knowledge to talk. Now nothing I said or his wife said or his kids said would have changed the ultimate outcome, which was tragic. He sort of lost his life to it. But it would have been nicer to be, for me to be more gracefully skilled at knowing how to accompany him through this process. And it was, it was a hard education, uh, which I try to share when I get the chance. The other hard conversation we have in this times is across difference, and especially across ideological difference. I work at the New York Times, the Atlantic Magazine, PBS, Yale. I am the expert at elite organizations. Uh, and people come to me often with critique, and they attack me from the left to the right with critique. And I want to be defensive and say, well, I'm, on, I'm one of the good guys here. But I have learned that my only job in those circumstances is to stand in their standpoint. It's to ask them three or four or five times in different ways, tell me about your point of view, tell me more, tell me more, what am I missing here? And I may not agree with them and they may never agree with me, but I will have showed respect. And curiosity, persuasion is not about 80% talking and 20% listening. It's about 80% listening and 20% talking. And there's a great book I highly recommend called Crucial Conversations by a guy named Joseph Grenny and a bunch of other co-authors. And they say, in any conversation, respect is like air. When it's absent, when it's present, nobody notices. When it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. And so every conversation, they say, exists on two levels, what we're nominally talking about and the under conversation, which is the volley of emotions that are going on between us as we speak. With every comment, we're making somebody feel more respected or less, more safe or less. And so what, what, how are you communicating that under conversation? And that's just vital, I think, to any kind of repair of, of democracy. Uh, so I've gone around and I now, I spent four years asking people, tell me about a time you felt seen. And people would, sometimes the stories were very ordinary. Uh, I ran to a woman in her 40s who said, when I was 13, I had my first alcohol and I got so drunk, I passed out on front, my front porch and I couldn't move. And my dad came out, and I thought, he was, I, knew, I thought he was gonna scream at me the stuff that I was screaming at myself. I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. Instead, he just picked me up in his arms, he carried me inside and put me on the sofa and said, there'll be no punishment here, you've just had an experience. And she, it was a normal episode of parenting, but she remembered it 40 years later as the time her dad knew what she was thinking and didn't need to say it. Most of the time when I ask people, tell me about a time you've been seen, or often, it's teachers people mention. And so I had a friend tell me uh, a story about his son who was uh, in second grade and she was struggling. And the teacher said to her, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. And that one little comment turned the girl's ear around 
because the thing that she thought she was bad at, social awkwardness, was actually a good trait. Her teacher believed in her, and she felt seen. When I heard this story, I thought of my own 11th grade teacher, Mrs. Dewsnap, my English teacher. I was making some smart-ass column comment in class, which is what I now get paid to do. Um, <laughs> and she says to me, David, you're trying to get by on glibness. You need to stop it. On the one hand, she said this in front of the whole class. I was kind of humiliated. On the other hand, I thought, wow, she really knows me. I'm so honored. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, Rabbi Elliot Kukla tells a story about effective empathy. He had a, a, a congregant who, because of a brain injury, would sometimes fall to the ground, just on the floor. Uh, and she told Kukla, I think people rush to help me up because they're so uncomfortable with seeing an adult lying on the floor. But what I really need is for someone to get down on the ground with me. And that, to me, is a beautiful encapsulation of empathy, not what makes you comfortable, but what the other person really needs. Sometimes in politics, you find somebody who really sees somebody. So in 1932 or 33, a 28-year-old congressman named Lyndon Johnson went to visit FDR in the Oval Office. And they had a meeting for like half an hour, and after it, FDR turned to his aide, Harold Ickes, and said, you know, Harold, that's the kind of uninhibited young pro I might have been as a young man if I hadn't gone to Harvard. Uh, and then he continued, in the next couple of generations, the balance of power in this country is going to shift to the South and West. And that kid, Lyndon Johnson, could well be the first Southwestern president. That's impressive. That's a good, that's, a, that's seeing somebody. Sometimes when you see that it's, much more moving. And some of the most beautiful moments of their lives are when they saw someone or somebody saw them. There's a beautiful memoir by a woman named Catherine Schultz, who's a New Yorker writer. Her memoir is called Lost and Found. And she writes about her dad, Isaac, who survived the Holocaust uh, and traveled around, then came to this country. And Isaac sounds like a, just a wonderful guy. And he was voluble. He had opinions on everything. The infield fly rule in baseball, whether apple cobbler is better than apple crisp. He sounds like the best dad ever, uh, and quite the talker. But at the end, when he was really sick and dying, he just stopped talking. And nobody, the doctors or the family, could figure out, he's just gone mute. Uh, and so at the very end, Schultz's family gathered around dad, and they wanted to say the things they didn't want to leave unsaid. And she describes the scene. My father, mute but seemingly alert, looked from one face to the next as we spoke, his brown eyes shining with tears. I had always hated to see him cry and seldom did, but for once I was grateful. It gave me hope that for what may have been the last time in his life, and perhaps the most important, he understood. If nothing else, I knew that everywhere he looked that evening, he found himself where he had always been with his family, the center of the circle, the source and subject of our abiding love. And that's a guy who died well seen. It's a, just a beautiful scene to me. It gets me every time. Uh, so if it's great to feel seen, it's also great to be the seer. Uh, and so I um, was at my dining room table in DC reading a boring book, which is what I get paid to do. Uh, and I, from the dining room table, you can see our front door. And the front door opens, and my wife stands there on the threshold of the door. And the summer sun is coming in behind her, and she's just standing there. And she doesn't even notice that I'm there, because that's the kind of charisma I have. <laughs> um, and, but I have this sensation go sweep across my consciousness, which is, I really know her. I just know her through and through. And if you ask me what I knew about her at that moment, it wouldn't have been like the traits of her personality, or the biographical facts I'd use to describe to a stranger. It was sort of the whole flow of her being. Uh, it was like the incandescence of her smile, the undercurrent of occasional flashes of fierceness, some insecurities, just the whole harmonies and lifts and flows of her music. I almost had, a, I had this sensation that I wasn't looking at her. To some degree, I was looking out from her. And to really know someone, you have to be able to see a little how they see the world. And it was just a beautiful moment. Um, and the only word I can use in the English language to describe how I was looking at her was I wasn't inspecting her, I wasn't observing her, I wasn't scrutinizing her. The only word I can think in the English language is I was beholding her. Just an appreciative beholding. 
And a couple of weeks after it happened, I told some friends of mine about this. And they said, yeah, that's what we do with our grandkids. We just behold them. And it was a great moment. And that, those moments of seeing and being seen and human connection are just like what joy is all about. Happiness is about self-expansion. Joy is about self-disappearance in the presence of others. Uh, and it's just some of the best moments in life. Now, we live in a brutal age. Um, bitter politics, social media, even the famous dates of our age are bitter ones. September 11th, January 6th, October 7th. And so in this, it feels like this giant forces of dehumanization are closing in on us and threatening us. And so in this ethos, it's tempting to want to harden yourself. It's tempting to want to enter the world with distrust because the world is not trustworthy, has not been trustworthy to you. It's tempting to want to callous yourself over. But in my view, in this world, we need a kind of defiant humanism that knows that it's not naive to lead with, with trust. It's not naive to lead with curiosity. It's not naive to lead with embrace. And you will sometimes be betrayed and treated cruelly, but it's still a better way to go through the world, and most of the time people will respond the way you want them to. And so this defiant humanism was epitomized to me by, uh, I was at a bar late at night, at a hotel bar, alone. You would call it uh, sad guy drinking alone. <laughs> I call it research. Um, <laughs> and so I'm, all these brutal scenes from the Middle East on my Twitter feed. And then I turn to a, a video and it's of James Baldwin. And he's been interviewed in, sometime in the early 60s. And he says, there's not as much love as you would like in the world but there's enough, there's more than you would think. The world is held together by the love of relatively few people. And he said, what you remember when you walk down the street is that other person, that's you, that could be you. You could be that monster, you could be that saint, and you have to decide for yourself who you wanna be. And when I saw that video, it was, I, the phrase that left him mind was defiant humanism. Here was a guy who'd been treated rawly by the world but was refusing to become a warrior in the callous meaning of the word. He was going to be human, he was going to treat others humans, and he was going to still hunger for that kind of human connection that really is the salvation of a nation in hard times. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have seven minutes and 38 seconds for questions. So make your questions at least six or seven minutes each. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It was, I heard you speak before. It was fantastic, and I look forward to reading the book. Could you talk a little bit about um, your decision and in, in, in becoming a Christian? Like, yeah. So I grew up um, in Jewish home, as I said. Uh, I went to Christian schools and Christian, uh, I was in the choir. And I went to a Christian camp where I met my friend Pete. And so my joke is I was raised religiously bisexual. Uh, <laughs> but it, it didn't matter to me because I didn't believe in God, I didn't have any faith. Uh, and then in, um, about 13 years ago, I would say my experience of the world was transcended materialist categories. That I became aware of a tran just transcendental nature of reality, aware not only of God's presence, but mostly God's grace. It's weird that I believed in grace before I believed in God. But the sense of an embracing form of love. And then as a journalist, I believe people have souls. And I, journalism would be meaningless to me if each person wasn't a person of infinite value and dignity more than just their muscles, but had a soul and was worthy of being treated like a soul of, of infinite value and dignity. And so one person has a soul, then you think, well, if there must be a creator of souls. And then I was on the God's ugliest spot of my favorite city in, the, in, in my hometown of New York City. There's a really ugly place called Penn Station. And then there's an even uglier place 
which is the subway station next to Penn Station. And I was there one morning, and I just had the sense that all these people around me have souls. And their souls are singing, their souls are suffering, their souls are in pain, their souls are longing. And there must be a creator of souls. And that's when Jesus came into the car and said, follow me. No, that did not happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just began searching. Uh, and, and I began searching. Um, and when, when you begin searching, you, I learned, especially for Christians, they send you books. So I got about 600 books in like three months, only 350 of which were different copies of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Um, and when it came to faith, I, I'm still profoundly, and I feel more Jewish than ever before because now I think the stories are real. But somehow the Beatitudes um, were the moment of divine inspiration coming to earth. The Sermon on the Mount was the thing for me. It was a, it was a, it's a miracle to me that those words were, were uttered. And so I, I say, look, I'm more Jewish than ever before. I'm also more Christian than ever before. And my Jewish friends say, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> um, uh, and so um, I, I, I self-identify now as a, either the most Jewy Christian on the face of the earth or more Christian-y Jew. And I'm probably the most Jewy Christian. And I joke that me joining Christianity in 2013 was like, investing in the stock market in 1929. It was like not the best moment to join. <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> Could you go to the mic? Yes. Oh, thank you so much for the work that you do, the, your writings, and for reminding us that we are all sacred beings. And I think that's the most important message. My question is, um, with what's happening in college campuses now, the protests, um, our children are now being denied that voice of being allowed to protest what they think is very deeply right. sorrowful. Um, just three days ago, we witnessed a very ugly incident at the, uh, at the event uh, where a student was pushed out uh, for protesting. And I had a discussion with my daughter, who graduated from Tulane, about this. And she felt very, very hurt that this has happened, that we're not being allowed to protest. And I want to hear your view on this, because this is actually the right forum for our students mm -hmm. to protest. Whether they're disrupting anything or not, I think, is secondary to them having a voice. Because if, we, if they don't do it this way, there will be other uglier ways of doing it. And we all know the results of that. So I'd like to hear your views on this. Yeah. Uh, I guess my first view is, I mentioned I teach at Yale and I've been teaching on and off for 20 years. I think one of the tragedies that's happened over this time, and in some ways my students recently are some ways way more inspiring than my students of 20 years ago. They're more passionate, uh, they, um, they are really attuned, morally driven. Uh, they, if they go off to work at Goldman, they at least feel guilty about it. Uh, <laughs> But one of the things that has happened is that they're way more afraid to argue with each other. It's not even they think about it, it's just a code, a norm of non-argument has settled over a lot of campuses. It's because people don't know if they're gonna get, have horrible social consequences. And I think the regard that is just tremendously sad. And if you could have open conversations in class, there might be still need to protest, but maybe it would be a little less. The second thing that's happened is I have a dislike of us-them political theories. I'm a pluralist. I believe the truth is plural, that most of, most of politics is a competition between partial truths, and that values don't cohere. And therefore, the people who disagree with you probably have a piece of the truth, or at least you should be humble enough to hear it. And yet, when you tell people us-them stories, us good, them bad, you trigger all sorts of things in our evolutionary brain. People love the us-them the oppressor oppressed, the colonizer the colonized, the elites, for, the, the good people of MAGA America versus the evil elites. And those stories, I think, need to be short-circuited. And so I have to confess, when earlier we all heard this recording, we've heard it at each session, that don't disrupt. I guess I like hearing it. Because I, 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 I welcome a conversation with people, but I like to be in forums where that conversation is allowed. 
Uh, and so I guess I'm a little more, sometimes protests are necessary, believe me, I've read history. But in a setting like this, where I think people, most people are really open-hearted and open-minded, I think conversation and debate and argument beats disruption. So I like that report. <laughs> okay, we have 33 seconds, but I'm going to ask each of you to ask a quick question, and then I'll answer it with one word. Let's go with you first, and then, we'll, ma'am, we'll finish with you. Uh, how do you, say you've spent your 80% of the time listening, you've tried to make the other person feel heard. How do you then make yourself feel heard? Oh, it's, uh, I, okay, you ask, I'll think of that. Uh, I know you were seven when you, um, when you thought of, you wanted to be a writer, but like, what was your thought process and like, how did you know you wanted to be a writer? It's a very good question. Let me start with you and then I'll get to you. So how do you make yourself feel heard? Now here I'm thinking that I'm, I'm speaking too much from my own point of view. I have a column in the New York Times, getting hurt is not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> and so I should be more attuned to people who, and don't feel heard. And so I do think when somebody is not curious, not asking you a question, um, uh, then uh, sometimes there's no way to break through that person. Uh -huh. And I found if you're within with a diminisher, you can't turn them around. And so you just can't be in deep relationship. And so I, I do think when people who feel unheard, they obviously should assert their voice. And I'm feeling a little guilty of being a little privileged with the way I approach that. So, so thank you for that question. Uh, and as for your lovely question, I'll, t I'll tell you a story about my own daughter. So when she was five, she um, walked into a hockey rink, an ice hockey rink, and she felt immediately at home. And now she's 30 and she coaches hockey in Anaheim. Um, she's, she just felt at home. There was, and it was, and there, I ran at somebody, I asked, why do you become a painter? And the person said, I love the smell of paint. It's just somehow they feel, I, there's just this one little thing I just love doing. Uh, Albert Einstein was um, four, his dad gave him a compass. And he said, wow, hidden forces in the universe are driving this compass needle around. I want to study those. And so often, early in life, at your age, and you may not be aware of this for 20 years, we have moments, I call them enunciation moments, moments that you discover something you really feel at home with, and you're just there into, and they prefigure what's going to happen a lot of time in your life. And for me, it was that book, Paddington the Air, for my daughter was going to that ice hockey rink. For Einstein, it was a compass. But there's just the thing that f seems cool. And it's always good advice for all of us, do what you like to do. <laughs> like, what are you doing that makes you feel most alive? And so I, I'm, it may not have happened yet, but I bet sometime in your life, you'll just find something that seems, this is really cool. And if you can find three things in your life that are in a line, that are sort of similar, that you like to do, then you found the law of your nature. You found who you are. So I wish that for you. So thank you very much.